there are lots of reasons why um, Toronto and Chicago uh, should be engaged um, in a continuing partnership. And, and Mayor Tory really alluded to some of them. Um, our cities are economic engines, uh, both for, we would call in, this, in the, the U.S., our states, um, in your province, uh, global hub, hubs for commerce and culture. Um, but also, the, the thing I think that really um, binds us together is that Toronto is often called the city of neighborhoods, as is Chicago. Chicago is made up of 77 community areas, and those neighborhoods are the soul of our city. If you know anyone from Chicago, you know they are not shy to tell you <coughs> not only that they are from Chicago, but what neighborhood. And they will remind you about that, because this is something that is an incredible source of pride for people from my city. And while we are one city, Chicagoans take pride in their neighborhoods. Each is dynamic, vibrant, and culturally rich. Each is unique. We, have, we know that to have a healthy city, you have to have healthy neighborhoods. Not just some neighborhoods, but all neighborhoods. But while some of Chicago's neighborhoods thrive, and many of you that I have met over the course of the day have commented on that, there are still too many that suffer. And these neighborhoods are predominantly on the city's south and west sides. And for those of you who don't know, unfortunately, Chicago remains one of the most segregated cities in the United States. And when we talk about the south and the west sides, that is a polite way of saying black and brown neighborhoods that are suffering. Many of these neighborhoods lack basic resources and amenities that we know are the hallmarks of vibrant, healthy communities, things like grocery stores and health clinics, safe common spaces, good schools, convenient access to transportation, <clears throat> and in particular, places for our youth um, to be able to thrive and feel safe in their out-of-school times. These same neighborhoods, unfortunately, have been neglected in my city for decades as a result of decisions made and not made. And we pay for that neglect in many profound ways. And let me just say at the outset, anybody who has worked in this space, particularly thinking about how you bring economic vitality to neighborhoods, or those of you who are focused on the issue of poverty, which we are now like a laser beam in Chicago, knows, knows this. Neglecting individuals, families, and neighborhoods is not cost free. All of the items that were identified um, in the video and are now on these panels across the room, when you do not invest in people, when you neglect your most vulnerable residents, there is a price to pay. And I will talk a little bit more about that. When you think about the ways in which neglect manifests itself, of course, violence comes to the top of the list because it is the most obvious and threatening manifestation of neglect. The epidemic of violence is an epidemic of hopelessness, stemming from the absence of healthy, safe, and stable communities that support the lives and aspirations of individuals and families. In Chicago, we literally spend billions of dollars every year on local policing just to barely move the needle in some communities. The reality is that we cannot, of course, police our way out of these problems. The better, smarter way to address public safety is to look at the root causes of the violence and make sure that we are investing in people, in families, in communities <clears throat> at the earliest possible stage of life. And that, while I believe that there is a moral a reason for us to do that, if you purely look at the economics, there is a compelling financial reason <clears throat> for us to do the same. We have to give people in these communities a pipeline, not only into good paying jobs, safe, affordable, and supportive housing, but also we need to give them a pipeline to hope. Another way in which we are paying for the lack of investment is in life um, expectancy gaps. In many of the same neighborhoods that I am focusing on, these poor economically distressed neighborhoods, the difference in life expectancy is decades compared to healthier communities. And this disparity is not driven by gun-related homicides. It, it too, is a, lack of, is a result of the lack of access to healthy food, medicine, health care, the kind of things that we all take for granted that we know are essential to have a life that is worth living with dignity. 
Let me give you one example <clears throat> regarding this life expectancy gap. There's an area in the city um, that's known as Washington Park. It's on the south side. And it's a majority black, low-income community. Investments, whether they be from government, business, or philanthropy, have been few and far between for way too long. That same neighborhood sits next to Hyde Park. And Hyde Park, some of you may know, is the home of the University of Chicago, a world-class university, and also um, home to the University of Chicago hospital system, which is also well world-class in its offerings. These two neighborhoods are right next to each other. But the difference in Washington Park, which is majority black and low income, and Hyde Park, which is uh, a much more diverse um, neighborhood and diversity in economics as well, the life expectancy gap is 69 years in Washington Park, 82 years in Hyde Park. Literally right up ne next to each other, a few blocks separate them, and yet a world of difference in life expectancy. And when we think about that, we have to think about how do we break these cycles and end the disparities. And as an aside, it's not surprising to me that healthcare systems here in Toronto and this province are really leading this fight. And the reason is this, as many people in the room I'm sure appreciate, when we neglect our most vulnerable residents, the people who are in the front lines who see this every day are the police for sure, but also the healthcare system, because they show up on your doorstep needing um, treatment. When we don't have um, access to good, healthy um, uh, health care uh, options, as unfortunately the United States is a fact, people show up and use the emergency rooms as their primary care providers. That is why, for example, there's a hospital in the city of Chicago that has invested in housing for its most high users of emergency room sources because they, doctors there, through their data and analysis, realize that if we provide stable housing for these residents that are driving um, the use of our emergency room services and provide them with stability, then we're going to reduce the amount of times that they're coming to our emergency rooms and we'll have a better opportunity to intervene with them and provide them with a holistic range of services. So um, the hospital systems are on the front lines and it's important that we recognize the sacrifices that you are making and why you are leading a lot of these conversations about how we build healthy, safe communities. So thank you for that. <clears throat> the, the first tenet uh, in thinking about how we break these cycles of in disparities has to be with, in my view, with economic development. But economic development that is inclusive. In Chicago, what we have been talking about in my 10 months as mayor is making sure that our economic growth is inclusive. And by that I mean looking into these neighborhoods where we haven't invested and making sure that we are dealing everyone in to the health and prosperity and growth that we're seeing in other parts of our, our city. One of the ways in which we've done that is through an initiative that we're calling Invest Southwest. Again, going into the south and the west sides of our city that haven't seen economic development, bringing together um, people in those communities. We are investing in 10 commercial corridors over the next three years, $750 million of city dollars. And I'm happy to report that we have been joined by another $56 million um, in private sector investment led by, um, initially, the Bank of Montreal, BMO, which has a large presence um, in the city of Chicago. When we announced this program, BMO um, gave $10 million to help support one of these neighborhoods, and that support has then been uh, followed by other corporate investment. But the idea is not starting with a blank piece of paper, but investing with the communities to help them co-curate a future focused on commercial development, to be sure, but looking at it much more expansively and thinking about ways in which we can build affordability in neighborhoods so that we can um, create um, healthy uh, places for people of all generations to be able to gather in a safe environment. Thinking about uh, infrastructure improvements that we can bring to these neighborhoods through um, our city. So 
we have had an exciting time in bringing people together. Um, when we hosted four different town halls on this Invest Southwest program, we had over 2,000 people come to these various gatherings. Um, and really, I think the big takeaway for us is the level of enthusiasm and hope that all of these folks have brought to the table. Now, as I've said to my team and I shared with Mayor Tory today, it's great that we've lifted up this enthusiasm. Now we have to deliver. And we have to deliver in a comprehensive way that make, makes a difference in the quality of people's lives. We've got to prove to them that they have the tools at their fingertips in partnership with the government, but in partnership also with business and philanthropy and community-based organization to change the fortunes of these neighborhoods and bring the kind of catalytic investment that is going to be necessary in the long haul to build capacity so that when we um, move to other areas of the city that we'll make our investments in, we have created the infrastructure to uh, sustain development and growth for the long term in these neighborhoods. Another important thing that we must focus on in thinking about how do we build um, healthy um, cities, of course, is public safety. This is something that Coming from my background, I'm a formal federal prosecutor. I've worked with local law enforcement in a, a number of different capacities. But what I know is that if we are not safe, people will not stay, people will not come, they will not invest. It's critically important to the future of our city that public safety is not just a commodity that's available to the wealthy, but it's something that is tangible and real, <clears throat> regardless of economics and background and neighborhood. We are striving to make Chicago the safest big city in the United States. <clears throat> that means that we have to look beyond um, our own city resources and coordinating policy that accounts for the full array of public self safety and health that exists in Chicago. What we have um, initiated is really an all-hands-on-deck approach. And by that, I mean we're not relying on law enforcement only and first as a solution to public safety. We're bringing in our schools, our libraries, um, our public health system, and even our infrastructure departments to look at what resources we can bring to bear in, the, in those neighborhoods that are most stressed by violence and layering a number of different resources and interventions so that we can bring violence down um, and really get to a place where people feel safe sitting out on their porch, walking the street, sending their kids to the parks. That's a luxury that we take for granted in many parts of our city that isn't available to way too many. So creating those kinds of safe neighborhoods and safe community spaces is critically important to the health and well-being of our, of our city. Of course, um, we can't do any of this if we don't uh, make sure that our city finances um, are rock solid. We have a very different tax structure in the United States, as I'm sure you appreciate. When I walked into office, we um, had a budget deficit that was $830 million for this year alone. And so we got rolled up our sleeves and got to work um, to really come up with a solution um, that was focused on structural long-term reforms so that we weren't going to the taxpayers over and over again and asking for more. Taxes in the United States are the third rail, particularly property taxes um, in my city of Chicago. So we demonstrated to our residents that we were going to make the sacrifices first to make government run much more efficiently before we were looking to them for anything else. And I'm happy to report that we closed this $838 million budget um, deficit without a significant property tax increase. Um, now, as I've said very cl uh, clearly, I can't promise that that's going to be uh, the story of every budget that we put forth. But we are demonstrating to folks that we care about making sure that government is running efficiently, that we're digging down and looking at ways in which we can do better, and treating taxpayers like the fiduciaries that we, they are, and making sure that we use their precious tax dollars well and efficiently. And that's important also because <clears throat> everything that we do in government is under a microscope in these days, and it probably already, always has been. But particularly in the United States, what we've seen in the last few years in particular, is really um, a lack of trust of government officials really at every level. Um, the winds of change that have blown different folks into office over these years are born of people's frustration that they don't believe that government works for them. 
that they don't believe that government um, is putting them first, and that elected officials place a priority on securing their own electoral future, uh, future um, rather than working hard, making the tough choices to bring prosperity and, and vibrancy um, to our cities and putting people first. So among the other things that we're doing to really create um, a healthy, vibrant city is focusing on ethics reform. Because I truly believe that if public leaders are not viewed with legitimacy, all of the tough things and decisions that we have to make are going to be for naught. We're not going to have people supporting us because they're not going to believe that we're putting them first. So I placed a huge emphasis in my time in office, and I will continue to, on making sure um, that we are winning the trust of our people, that we're being as transparent as we possibly can, that we're making the right decisions because it's the right thing to do, not the political thing to do. Um, because, it all, as I said before, all of these things that we want to accomplish, the things that we want to do to really move the needle and transform our city, to make sure that we continue to grow our population and create opportunities for all men or business, small, medium, and large, to provide good paying jobs that you can build a future on, none of those things can be possible without the support of our residents, and we can't get that support if we're, we're not viewed as legitimate. So that's, to me, a key pillar. Now, Mayor Tory alluded to one of the other big initiatives that we have taken on in our city. As I said, we are doing a lot to really expand economic opportunities for people in our neighborhoods. But one of the toughest issues that we are now facing is the question of poverty. It is crushing too many people of our, in our city. And whether it's um, from the lack of job opportunities, the lack of good health care, all the things that we know are trapping people in the grip of intergenerational poverty, it's something that we must tackle head on. So <clears throat> a week ago, we hosted the first ever um, City of Chicago Symposium on Poverty. And we called it STEP, Solutions to End Poverty. And the challenge that I have given myself and my government and that I've given to the city is to end poverty in a generation. In that summit, we brought together um, over 700 different people from every neighborhood in our city, not just experts, not just um, doctors and scientists, but also people who are working on the front lines in community-based organizations who are seeing the effects and manifestations of poverty every single day. Now, we are working towards um, a process of engagement with people who are actually suffering every day. And we've done a number of things that I think will move the needle. But we also know, and I'm mindful of the admonishment of one of our speakers, while we are working on kind of the grand vision, the grand plan, there are things each of us can do every single day, every single day to make a difference. And so I, the challenge that we have taken on and the challenge and commitment that every single person that was at the symposium did is to say, what can I do, not at some point in the future, but right now today, every week, to think about how I can open up opportunities for those who are suffering. And just to give you a few statistics to set the frame of what this challenge is about, in our city, one in five people live in poverty. One in five. We have people in our city, a significant portion, that are living on $8.50 a day. When you have that kind of poverty, and for example, 76% of our, our students and our public schools rely upon free or reduced meals to be able to eat every day. When we think about the number of people who are homeless, and, and we're fortunate that we don't see the numbers of homelessness like Los Angeles or San Francisco or some other states, but it remains an issue. And many of the people that are homeless are people of color. There are a lot of women. We have 16,000 students in our public schools um, who are homeless. When we think about those numbers, it's more than just statistics. These are peoples, these are people, and their lives are going to be forever um, shaped, and usually not for the good, by the fact that we have not reached out to them, we have not provided the kind of supports that we need to, and I want to change that around entirely in the city of Chicago, and we're doing that. One of the first things that we did when I came into office was looked at our regressive fines and fees regime. And here's what I mean by that. 
In our city, we have balanced our budget year after year after year on the backs of those who are least able to afford it. We have sent people into bankruptcy. We've taken their cars, taken their driver's license privileges because of non-moving violation tickets. Tickets that generate a significant amount of revenue in theory, but take people out of the economy. Um, the Cook County, which is the county that Chicago is in, is one of the highest Chapter 13 bankruptcy filing jurisdictions in our country. And what that means is individual bankruptcies. And the vast majority of people who are filing for bankruptcy cite debt to the city of Chicago as a reason why they have to file for bankruptcy. That is a terrible statement about where we are. So we've started to unwind our addiction to fines and fees. We raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. We um, instituted one of the most progressive um, scheduling ordinances in the country, and by that I mean in many professions, healthcare, um, restaurants, hospitality, workers who don't typically work 40 hours a week have no idea from week to week what their schedule is going to be. And that means, particularly for women um, who are mothers, how do you arrange for childcare when you don't want, know when you're going to be working? How can you manage your cash flow when you don't know if you're going to have a certain number of hours? So we put into place some changes in the city of Chicago that requires employers of a certain size to provide predictive scheduling so that our workers know when they're going to be working, when they're going, how many hours they're going to be working, um, and how much money they're going to be making so that they can manage their lives. These are some of the things that we're working on to break the grip of poverty and that the city of Chicago has the ability and the levers to pull to make a difference in equality of people's lives. We're just getting started. There's many more things that we can do, but, but these are things that I think are important to making sure that we are building real opportunity and pipeline to good paying jobs with benefits for people in our city, that we stop the exodus of the population, that we start to grow our city, but we grow our city in a way that is inclusive and equitable and fair. And if we do that, and if we partner with hospital systems, if we partner with community-based organi uh, organizations that are really doing the Lord's work in our, in our neighborhoods every single day, we will start to transform the trajectory of our city, which I believe is critically important for our future. Chicago is a great global city, but I say this all the time in lots of different groups, particularly amongst our business community. We cannot be great if we ignore the cries of our most vulnerable residents, if we do not deal them in to prosperity, if we do not recognize and acknowledge the way in which we have disinfected in communities primarily on the basis of race. If we don't face those hard truths as a city and do better to make sure that we're creating opportunities for people in every neighborhood, people that look like me and are growing up in families like I grew up in, that is our obligation as a government. That's our obligation as leaders in public life. I feel that deeply in my core. And I am grateful for the opportunity that I've been given by the voters of my city to make a difference in the quality of life for our residents. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to be here with you. I appreciate the work that you are all doing. Thank you.